In this video, we're going to have a look at the archaeological site of Delphi, which is one of the prescribed sources that you can be asked about on the 10 marker. By the end of this video, I want you to be able to identify the key features of this sanctuary, but also to think about the way in which it's laid out, the significance of certain features, and the role and function in general of the archaeological site of Delphi. So let's start by thinking about its layout and location. So Delphi is located on the side of Mount Parnassus. So this is a sort of pilgrimage for those visiting that they have to climb up. And um, if you have a look at the plan there on the right, you can see that we've got a kind of a snaking path starting at the bottom right that continues up through the sanctuary. There's only one way up and one way down at Delphi. And the sanctuary is um, situated on various terraces. So you're climbing higher and higher throughout. And you can see that from this next image here. So this is the view from the terrace just above the theatre. But if you look further down at the bottom of the theatre, you can see the Temple of Apollo, the remains there. And if you look a little bit further down again, just to your right, you can see the reconstructed Athenian treasury. So this is a sanctuary that reveals more of itself the higher you climb. And this is emphasised as well by the fact that the Sacred Way has very sharp hairpin bends. So you can't always see what's around the corner until you get there. In terms of location, Delphi was also the navel, the belly button of the ancient world. This is a quote from Michael Scott. Uh, this alludes to the story of Zeus and the two eagles, where he released an eagle from each end of the world and wanted to see where they would meet. Uh, and Delphi being the belly button or the omphalos was represented by this stone you can see here that's now in the Archaeological Museum today. We believe it to be a Hellenistic or a Roman copy of the original that was kept in the Abiton of the Temple of Apollo. So in terms of location, a very special place indeed. Now, if we have a look at the picture here of the entranceway to Delphi, you will notice that unlike Athens, there is no formal gateway, no propylia. Um, just if you look to the map on the right, I'm going to be circling where exactly we are in Delphi at any given time. Um, so this is simply a place that you enter through the, the break in the Peribolos wall, the, the entrance wall. And one of the first things that you would have seen as you started to, to walk up the sacred way would have been uh, statue groups. There would have been statue groups on either side. And what we can see here is a kind of reconstruction and imagining of what Delphi would have been like at its height. And there would have been in classical times several major groups of life-size sculptures arranged on various raised stone platforms, almost like little stages, little theatre stages. And the majority of these were mainly victory monuments for wars that had happened between different Greek states. One of those was the Marathon Monument. So this was put up by the Athenians after um, 490 BC, and it featured a dozen impressive bronze figures meant to have been uh, sculpted by Phidias. And in fact, there are some suggestions that the Riachi warriors who are featured here on this slide may have originally have been from this marathon group. Uh, another huge group was commemorating Tegea's victory over Sparta, and then another was Sparta's victory over Athens. So Delphi might have been a religious sanctuary, but what we're also seeing here in terms of function is it was a place for intercity conflict to also play out. This doesn't seem to have embarrassed the Greeks, this kind of one-upmanship. Instead, it is likely an extension of athletic competition. Another example of a statue group that would have been at Delphi and is now still in the archaeological museum there is Cleobus and Biton, so called because they've been associated with a pair of brothers named in Herodotus's histories uh, who had pulled their mother's cart to the temple of Hera in Argos. And after performing this great deed, their mother had, had prayed for them to have the greatest honour they could possibly have. 
and they passed away in their sleep. They had achieved a good death. Um, and these brothers were commemorated with this honorific monument at Delphi, showing that Delphi really is a place to be seen and to have your deeds showcased, not just these big city states I've mentioned previously, like Athens and Sparta, but we've also got some individual cases as well. Looking to our map now, we've kind of left the entranceway behind and we've moved towards a cluster of smaller buildings. These are known as treasuries and these are small, ornate, they're decorated buildings and they have two purposes. So on the one hand, their functional purpose is to house offerings from a particular city state to the gods of Delphi. But because they are also decorative and in a pan-Hellenic sanctuary, they are a place for that city-state to also show off. Um, there were over 30 in total. You can see foundations of uh, some of them. Others are unidentifiable. Uh, but the two with the most substantial remains, the first is the treasury of the Athenians, which you can see on the screen at the moment. This has been rebuilt with original blocks. And if you go up close, has a rather famous wall covered with inscriptions, including and the musical notes for one of the hymns to Apollo, which is really nice. However, the most ornate one overall was that of the Siphnians from the small island of Siphnos. And the remains of the art, the sculpture from this particular treasury, were are still in the Delphi Archaeological Museum today. They're all marble, incredibly impressive. It had a pediment, it had caryatids as the columns at the front, uh, and it also had a frieze that ran around all four sides. And in terms of subject matter, just a couple of notable points there. There's two better preserved sides of the frieze. Uh, on the north, you can see here we've got a gigantomachy and those two mirrored figures there are Apollo and Artemis together. Notice how the giants are dressed as Greek hoplites. So this is meant to be a scene where the viewer identifies themselves with the giants who are acting with hubris by even attempting to go against the gods and are being punished as a result. We also have uh, the east side. This time we have got a scene from the Trojan War. We've got Achilles and Memnon on the right hand side and they're fighting over the fallen body of Antilochus, Nestor's son. And we've got next to them the gods sat in council. So there's just a, a smattering of the gods there for you to have a look at. And they are discussing or weighing the outcome of this particular duel. So what we're seeing on the Siphonian treasury here are scenes that are linked to the power of the gods and their ability to influence mortal lives. And we're being reminded at this religious sanctuary of their superiority. We also see various uh, votive monuments as well. So in the Archaeological Museum at Delphi, we have the Naxian Sphinx. This would have stood on a tall Ionic column uh, just below the Apollo's, uh, Apollo Temple's terrace at Delphi. You can see that on the image there on the bottom right. So it would have been really imposing and it served as a guardian within the sanctuary, but also like we've seen with the statue greets, with the treasuries, it's a reminder of Naxian power and influence. We've now climbed up to the center of the sanctuary and not surprisingly, we've got the Temple of Apollo there right at the heart of our sanctuary. Um, we have a really interesting description from Pausanias telling us a little bit about the temple. Uh, originally, apparently, it was made of laurel uh, and designed in the shape of a hut. Then later, apparently, the people of Delphi told him it was made by bees out of beeswax and feathers. And then a third temple was made of bronze. This may hint at some pre-stone building me methods, but we're getting onto much more secure ground when we look at the archaic temple to Apollo, which sadly burnt down uh, in the 6th century BC. The temple of Apollo, whose ruins that we're looking at here now on these photographs, is actually the 4th century temple 
built after um, a landslide in the fourth century. But it does preserve the layout and even that style of that late archaic temple as well. Now, in the Archaeological Museum at Delphi, you can actually see what once decorated the pediments on this temple as well. So we're looking here at the east pediment from the older archaic temple. It appears to show uh, the arrival of Apollo at the apex on a chariot uh, and then with a frontal lineup of various gods either side. And then we've got kind of fantastic lions eating animal victims in the corners there. Uh, it was updated in the classical period, this pediment, and instead we get Apollo on the far left, and he's very much in the guise of the priestess of Apollo here, the Pythia. He sat on a tripod, he's holding a branch of laurel and a fiali, uh, which were all symbols of his oracle, and he has got his mother Leto, his sister Artemis, and the muses there, because of course he's god of music, all on that pediment with him. So what we're seeing here is that the artwork on the Temple of Apollo, the function is to, to reinforce the god whose sanctuary it is, as well as his power, his oracular power in this case, his relations to other mortals, late, uh, sorry, immortals, Leto and Artemis, and also his specific roles as well, linking to god of music. And um, the archaic West pediment was probably a gigantomachy, but we can see from the classical pediment still in the museum today, uh, and apologies, the sunlight was particularly bright on the day I was trying to take this photo, that we've got Dionysus, and he is amongst um, Thyads, who are Maenads that were specifically located on Mount Parnassus. And if you're wondering why Dionysus is at Delphi, well, he is supposed to have stood in for Apollo during the three months of the year that he was absent. It's also worth me pointing out that at the entrance to the Temple of Apollo, just reminding us that you know the whole point of, um, the, of this center point here was to come and to worship Apollo and to sacrifice to him, we've got an altar. And this altar was dedicated uh, by the people of the island of Chios, the Chians, and it would have earned them a special privilege. This is known as uh, pronantia, and that gave them a kind of a, a privilege, a right to consult the oracle first. But the altar here, just reminding us that this was a place of worship fundamentally, as well as, as of course, us seeing that um, intercity rivalry throughout our climb up. We also, from this vantage point, would have seen another uh, victory monument. This is known as the Serpentine Column and Herodotus tells us uh, about this and describes it being made from the melted down bronze of weapons and armour of the Persian army after the Battle of Plataea and it had inscribed on it the names of the 31 Greek city-states that had come together uh, to, to fight the Persian force. This is just a replica that you can see at Delphi today the actual original is in the Hippodrome at Istanbul. And if you go to the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, you can see one of the surviving three snake heads because this spiral column was finished off um, as such. Climbing up higher again, we have now reached our theatre space. And coming back to this photograph, if we have a look at it, uh, the stone seating that we're looking at was completed in the second century BC. And earlier than this, it would have been a little less formal, taking advantage of kind of the natural slope of the um, topography here. We've got 35 rows of seats and it would have had a capacity of 5,000. Now, at Delphi, some of the first competitions, because this was a place of competition, just like Olympia, some of the first competitions would have been musical, uh, because Apollo was, of course, the patron god of music. And then the sports, as part of the Pythian Games, were added later. We now would have to leave what is the formal kind of tenemos, the sacred area, and climb up even higher 
through a break in the wall and we ascend through this steep winding path through rocks and trees and it kind of goes on for absolutely ages and you wonder when you're ever going to get there but when you do you'll notice from my photograph here that you'll find a really large stadium so this is 177.5 meters in length and again it's kind of fitted into the natural slope of our sanctuary We've got seating this time for six and a half thousand spectators. So, you know, these are really, really large uh, venues because, of course, this is a Panhellenic sanctuary. And what we have had found here, which is really exciting, is the famous bronze charioteer of Delphi. So he was was uh, buried near the Sacred Way at this point and is a really good example as again if you want to be able to talk about Delphi being kind of notice board of the ancient world a place to be seen because he would originally have had horses chariot slave boy this was a really large bronze group uh, and a massive showcase of wealth from Polyzalus of Gala the Sicilian charioteer who was putting it up to signify um, his win in the Pythian games of either 478 or 474 BC. So just to summarise what we've learnt about Delphi as a sanctuary. It's located on the side of Mount Parnassus and it requires a sort of pilgrimage for visitors who make the climb. It was also considered the omphalos or centre of the Greek world, so it has a special place uh, in the heart of the ancient Greeks. There's only one way up and down via the sacred way with its hairpin bends and the sanctuary is built on various terraces so you're revealing more of itself the higher a person climbs up. We know that Delphi was a religious sanctuary but it's also the notice board of the ancient world, it's a place to be seen and I've given you hopefully various examples of votive offerings that you can discuss such as the treasuries themselves or individual monuments or even statue groups from whole city-states. Each have their messages and intercity rivalry seems to have been an extension of the athletic competition that took place at Delphi. The Temple of Apollo is right at the centre of the sanctuary and decorated with artwork directly linked to the gods celebrated at this site, reminding us that still Delphi is fundamentally a place to come and worship Apollo. And even those really impressive athletic and theatrical spaces are still linked to the worship of Apollo, showing the overlap between the two realms.